I have the pleasure today of introducing what sadly are our last speaker for this quarter uh, in this year, this academic year, but I'm, I'm really, really excited that we have with us uh, Gabrielle Marku, who um, is actually an, an alum. She was part of the inaugural class of undergrads here in the informatics department. Uh, she helped create the Informatics Stu Student Association, which later kind of morphed into IGSA and a couple of other different things that are still around today. Uh, after that, she went on to get her PhD from Carnegie Mellon and is now an assistant professor in the School of Information at Michigan, where uh, she specializes in human computer interaction and health research. Um, really excited to have her here and, and go ahead, take it away. Thanks so much. Um, it's always lovely to be back. Wish I could be in Bren Hall with you all, um, but this is nice too. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about designing for coordination at intervention and behavioral health. So I'll start off with how I think of behavioral health. Um, so what I did was take two places here locally in Ann Arbor that um, address behavioral health. And they listed the kinds of um, um, concerns and things they provide support for. And I combined those two lists into this long, huge list, which as you could see, uh, encompasses a lot. And some of these things, all of us are gonna experience like stress and college transitions and interpersonal conflict. And some of these things, I hope you never experience um, ever. And so there's, it's wide ranging, can affect us at any age and at, and at any point of our lives. So um, uh, there are, you know, specific areas in here that I have focused on and specific areas I haven't, but, but I introduced this broadly in order to take you to some higher level themes that I've been thinking about a lot, which can apply to all of these areas. Um, and these are these themes represent um, some of my latest thinking, which you're not going to find necessarily um, in my papers as of yet, but are things I'd love. I've been talking to um, some of you uh, today and would love to continue conversations about because these are sort of at the forefront of my mind and how the projects that I'm talking about today have sort of brought me to, to um, these most recent themes. So the first is how can we make space for agency within the structures and ecosystems of behavioral health? How can we consider the effects of marginalization when we conceive of behavioral health technologies? And how can an understanding of trauma influence how we design behavioral health technologies? So I'm gonna come back to these um, throughout my talk. Um, I'm gonna cover two uh, projects. Um, and a lot of what I do has to do with coordination and collaboration. And the two projects that I wanted to highlight today, um, one of them, uh, represent sort of work that I've done for a long time and then I'm, that I'm more well known for. Um, and the second one is, uh, is a new space for me. Um, so the first one is uh, about coordination across distributed teams. So people who, who work together, know each other, have met. Um, and the second then will go into coordination among strangers. And what does it look like to promote pro-social behavior and social support um, when it's people who, who are strangers to one another? So that's what we're going to cover uh, together today. So to start off with this first project, um, um, which just came out in um, CSCW, um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors who are wonderful students, up and coming researchers, um, Olivia uh, Richards, um, like, like me at Irvine, started off as an undergraduate researcher, um, and then I was lucky enough to get her at Michigan, and she's now finishing up her second year, and Adrian Choi was a master's student with us, and um, I hear is doing great in his first year at Georgia Tech as a doctoral student, so look out for these folks. Um, so children's care coordination um, is something that I've thought about since my dissertation. Um, this is Kristen Lind and um, her, her little boy Gabe, and she created this care map because uh, Gabe has complex special needs and there are so many different services and resources they need to navigate um, to get him to school, to get him the right types of um, services. And none of these talk to one another. And she's sort of color coordinated these within the school setting, 
um, and the kinds of special education services she re they receive at school, and then more traditional sort of healthcare, clinical settings, pediatrics, um, community-based support, legal and financial, um, recreation and people out in their community. And so none of these talk to one another and they represent so many different types of systems. And it all really falls on her as the parent, as the caregiver to do all of this coordination. And so my work looks at how we can use informatics and technology to help support more of this, um, these coordination tasks so it doesn't fall as much on someone like Kristen. Um, and so to review a little bit about how I've gotten to this project, um, things that I've been looking at are, we know that paper-based data collection is still very prevalent in behavioral health. We know that behavioral data, such as, you know, in special education, when they're trying to monitor kids' behaviors and see if there's improvements in behaviors, um, they're very subjective um, and difficult to represent. And so similar to some of the great personal informatics stuff going on here, I'm really fascinated by when is it really hard to measure and monitor things because they're very subjective behaviors. And then what I started to see is that there are so many breakdowns across organizational boundaries. So parents and teachers, teachers and clinicians, different types of clinicians across disciplines, um, there's, uh, it's very hard to collaborate around, uh, uh, across these boundaries. Um, and then they're also very interdependent on one another um, to get data and to understand um, behaviors and to, to reflect on how a child is doing. So they need each other, but they can't always successfully work together across boundaries. Um, and that's what I became really interested in. And by the time we got to this study, it was like, why can't everyone just work together? Um, and that's what we really explored. And then at the bottom here, I'll just sort of mention these are not as directly related to the project I'll be talking about. Um, but other sort of threads that are related that we're excited about. One is getting, um, needing uh, more ways to engage children themselves with their behavioral data. Um, and then concerns about how behavior management technologies, so if you're familiar with something like Class Dojo, which is uh, becoming very popular in um, classrooms all around the country, um, how might that be used to promote surveillance of children instead of as much for behavioral support? So, there's breakdowns, what's going on? Um, these are the research questions in these studies, in this study, because I wanted to understand if, if people can't even agree on what this child needs, um, then let's really take a look at what it takes to develop shared understanding. So first, what are the barriers to developing shared understanding? What practices contribute to developing a shared understanding? And what types of information do different types of members of a child's care team need from one another because they're so interdependent um, so that they can develop the shared understanding together? And so what we did is uh, uh, we studied field sites um, at three programs um, that were focused on children's behavioral health, but they represented these different systems. So we looked across healthcare and education. So the first one was a feeding disorders program. So this one's sort of the most clinical. It was a hospital-based intensive um, program that had outpatient and inpatient components. And it was a multidisciplinary team, including behavioral psychologists, dietitians, speech language pathologists, things like that. Um, and then the social schools program was a smaller program, part of a private therapy center for autistic children and their families. And this was weekly sessions in a peer group setting. They had one-to-one -one therapeutic support, but really just an opportunity to get together outside of a school setting and really be able to practice their social skills together with a lot of support. And then finally, um, right in a school setting was a behavior disorder program that was made up of two, uh, what are called self-contained special education classrooms and a regular public elementary school and so um, we had uh, special education teachers, paraprofessionals, and a social worker that oversaw the program. So we did field work with people who represented the perspectives of clinicians, educators, and the home caregivers. So we observed across all of the programs and we did interviews. Um, the, the age ranges of the programs were slightly different, but overall it was children anywhere from age one to 14. And we used inductive thematic analysis to compare across um, interview transcripts and observation, uh, uh, and then um, 
compared across contexts and across um, the perspectives of these different stakeholders. So ultimately what we came up with was this model of what it takes to develop shared understanding. So to walk you through it, that first research question was about barriers. So first people can have differences in their approaches and motivations um, to the child's be uh, behavior and what should be done about it. Um, they have this inability to rely on documentation. So largely because it is so paper-based, it's difficult to share. Um, it's not always consistently documented. Um, they have very different ways of, of taking data on the behaviors. And then we also saw a lot of information loss when they're trying to transfer information across the care team. And then there are these two mechanisms. So across the programs, we were able to see some teams that that we're, we're not really able to see eye to eye and still sort of struggled to work together. And we noticed that there were teams that were able to develop shared understanding. So while these barriers were common across all of them, what we then started to, to look at was those who are able to cross the barriers, what are the mechanisms through which they're doing that? And what makes them able to um, successfully develop a shared understanding so that they're working together cohesively as a team? Um, so part of that was building relationships across boundaries and putting that effort to have a working relationship. And then once that's established, they can share actionable information. And I'll come back to what I mean by actionable. So then the main piece of this model is this last piece of what are these practices that are contributing to the development of shared understanding. So across different types of teams, across different types of settings, we were then able to look at what are specific things that they're doing um, um, together. So um, I'll just point out some examples here. Um, there's a nice, lovely, long paper, uh, my PhD student's first, first authored paper that she did a great job on. So I encourage you to go read her, um, her paper. So one of the practices that helped them build relationships across boundaries was engaging the whole person. So here's one example of a quote from the behavior disorder program. And the therapist told us, we have a treasure chest that's used to reward and motivate the children as they achieve in the clinic. We often rig the game for the child's benefit. So if we know they happen to like Yoda, it may magically appear. After eight weeks, you usually get it and know what they like and what would be motivating for them. So this didn't have anything to do specifically with the treatment or the data they needed to take on, on whether their child was making progress. So children in this program typically come in with a feeding tube and are not able to successfully feed and swallow food. And, um, and so there's behavioral components and more medical components to, to, to the treatment um, to eventually having them successfully eat food. Um, and so, but what made working together uh, um, much more effective, what, what they were doing was taking this time to figure out what are the child's interests. Um, a lot of the treatment was really play-based and engaging the child um, in, in play. And that was so important and also then um, uh, helped the parent to see uh, that they were trying to, to get to know their child and engage their child. So uh, moving on to um, sharing actionable information, there were two different types of information um, that they shared that was effective at developing shared understanding. The first is prescriptive, which is really about teaching or informing them or transferring practical knowledge. So this often came from the specialist, from the clinician or teacher, training the parent and sharing with the parent, you know, their expertise. Not always, but it tended to be um, that way. Whereas uh, the other kind was descriptive information. Um, which is more holistic knowledge about behaviors um, in context. So not a specific kind of um, piece of, of knowledge you might need to have to interpret a behavior, but just something that you notice. When the, the, when the child is at home, they tend to behave in this way, or when a child sees Yoda, they tend to behave in this way, or within a, with a particular other student at school, you're noticing these behaviors. Um, so to give you an example here, um, uh, one thing that was important was critical information sharing. So um, in the school context, uh, one of the parent told us, one of the parents told us um, they wanted information in some format that is detailed, informative, constructive, and lacks 
the kind of negative affect and judgment that sometimes comes through with an unstructured text message. He might have that same reaction and I can use the same words that are in his school social story to help him at home. So what's interesting here is that a text message is a very quick way for um, parents and teachers to stay in touch. And sometimes the critical information they needed to share was, hey, we had a rough morning or we had a rough weekend or something like that. He's in a bad mood or you, you might be careful about this thing or that thing. Um, and that's what we mean by critical is it's sort of time sensitive. It's this is what's going on with the child right now. Um, so when I'm handing them off to you in this new context, um, here's what you should know about what happened in the home context um, and why you might be seeing a certain kind of behavior. Um, and what they're noting about uh, as much as we think that quickly exchanging information uh, through a text message might be useful and most efficient, um, it's so efficient and so unstructured and so fast that for a parent, it could come across as negative or even judgmental. And so um, structuring it a little bit, um, uh, this is an interesting example in that sometimes we think more information might be useful and that's just gonna take up more time, right? And how are we gonna ask any of these people to put in more time? Um, and that's what's interesting is that we don't always need more. It's just adding structure um, can even make it less time intensive to share that information and it can help it come across um, in the right way. This is a parent who was engaged, who wanted information and wanted to help um, uh, with the strategies that were being used at school and translate those at home too. Um, they just wanted a certain type of information shared in a certain way that could, they could then act on at home. All right, so that is a whirlwind, but that is our model. <laughs> um, just to, to quickly cover the, the contribution and the takeaways from this. Um, in terms of this left side here with building relationships across boundaries, um, we think that these are really nuanced interactions that would be difficult to replicate or even enhance using technologies. Um, we're not suggesting that we should try to design technology on this side, but we think that with an understanding and appreciation for how these practices work and contribute to these relationships um, and, and, and developing shared understanding, then we can avoid designing technologies that unintentionally impede them. But, and uh, on this side is where we think there's a lot of attention that can be paid to how we can design um, tools to facilitate um, sharing of information. Um, and this is how we can enable better distributed care coordination involving a diverse team of professionals and non-professional caregivers and how we can help them get across um, organizational and contextual boundaries. So again, I'll point you to the paper. We had some specific suggestions here for both prescriptive and descriptive information and what might help um, these teams work together better. So to come back to um, my themes here, one thing we learned about agency from this project was that information often can't be just be transmitted quickly and efficiently. Caregivers need to be actively engaged in learning and co-creating a shared understanding about their child's behaviors and what their child needs. In terms of marginalization, building relationships across boundaries can help practitioners get to know the caregiver and child holistically to understand their challenges. So um, this is a potential avenue to explore. I'm not saying it's gonna fix anything immediately, but um, the way that we saw this happening and the strategies that we, and practices that we saw in terms of getting to know the child as well as the parent more holistically in their, their family life, um, this is a potential avenue to explore um, to address the effects of marginalization and understand that better. And then finally, um, given some of the tensions that I had seen in my past work that made me want to study shared understanding, this study really helped me see how the lack of a shared understanding could be contributing to re-traumatization, lack of trust, and breakdowns in collaboration. And when your child has behaviors and has these types of needs, likely that you've been traumatized some way in the past by people not supporting your child and not giving them what it, what, what it was that they needed. So that's been coming up in our work. Okay, so moving on to project two um, with coordination among strangers. This project is in collaboration um, with the School of Public Health at Drexel University and with Bar Ilan University in Israel. So we have 
um, uh, several publications out now, but we haven't published it in your typical HCI venue. So I'm really excited to share this with my HCI family and friends <laughs> because it's an exciting project. Um, maybe someday you'll see it at Kai, but not quite yet. So um, uh, this project's focusing on the opioid epidemic um, in Philadelphia, um, where it's quite bad. So the rate of drug-related overdose deaths is triple in Philadelphia than the national average. Um, and I've been asked how this has been going during the pandemic, and we do know that it's only gotten worse. Um, and the, pan the pandemic has made the opioid epidemic worse, and 2020 was the deadliest year. Um, ever for, for overdoses with some of the most recent data that we have. So one of the greatest tools that we have um, is naloxone, um, which is also known by the brand name Narcan. This used to be injectable, but it's now um, available via nasal spray. And it's a medication that you just spray in someone's nose and it reverses an overdose. So someone can be close to death and it immediately reverses it and it can revive them and, and bring them back to life. Um, there are no downsides. There are no um, side effects. If someone isn't overdosing and you put this in their nose, nothing bad happens. Um, and so one of the greatest efforts is to get as much of this out into the community as possible and arm people with, um, with, with Narcan to be ready to, uh, to respond when someone's overdosing. And to just with all the numbers and how overwhelming the epidemic can be, um, it can be hard to forget the sort of real faces and real human people and lives behind this. So I just wanted to give you an example. Um, this is Erica Hurt um, from Indiana, and um, she had some uh, media coverage when she was celebrating being three years sober. Um, like many people, she had an opioid prescription for pain that eventually led to addiction. And uh, she wrote that what is really important today is the fact that Narcan saved my life. Narcan kept me alive until I wanted to live. While I can admit that my son was unfortunately not enough to keep me sober then, he is my motivation today. Had Narcan not been available to me or had someone who felt that I didn't deserve Narcan been there that day, I would have never had the chance to get sober and my son would be growing up without ever knowing his mom. So that's the kind of impact that Narcan can have, and it can be very, very difficult to, um, um, to get into recovery. But each time um, I, I talk to people who had 17 overdoses and were alive and talking to me. So each time Narcan is administered, it gives someone uh, one, more, one more chance. So there are many community-based organizations um, that are harm that take harm reduction approaches, if you're familiar with that term. And they do things like needle exchange programs and they do uh, Narcan training and distribute Narcan to the local community. So um, in this project, we, uh, we focus on the uh, Kensington neighborhood of Philadelphia, which is where there's a lot of concentrated um, heroin um, and, and uh, other types of use. And so um, Angels in Motion and Prevention Point Philadelphia are some of these organizations that are working on the ground. Um, uh, many people who work there and volunteer there are in recovery and um, are very dedicated to, to helping others. And so our idea was um, if someone leaves one of these trainings and um, knows how to identify an overdose and has Narcan on them, what if we also gave them a smartphone app and um, maybe there's a time when they don't have Narcan on them, or sometimes you might even need multiple doses of Narcan if uh, the drugs are laced with fentanyl, which is exponentially more um, potent than heroin. Um, it might take more than one dose to revive someone. Um, so the idea is you see someone overdosing, um, you don't have Narcan, but you can call for help. Um, instead of calling 911, which some people are very hesitant to do, um, um, to at least do something to, to help save the person's life, um, you use our app to, um, to find someone nearby and get them. And they, um, we send out the signal um, within, a cert, within a 15 minute response radius. Um, we also notify EMS at the same time so that we make sure professional responders are, are coming and medical attention will also get there. Um, but uh, models show that uh, within a, um, with the amount of Narcan that it's likely to be in a community like this, 
someone can respond, a lay person can respond faster than professional first responders are going to, to get there. And even if you shave off a few minutes, that's huge for someone's brain if, um, if they're overdosing. So once uh, a potential responder uh, accepts the request and says they're on their way, then they get uh, directions. They can also chat, um, send messages to the bystander who had sent out the call. So that's the, the model. That was the idea that um, we came up with. This has been used in other scenarios where you can share medication. So um, anaphylaxis, um, an EpiPen can be shared. Um, if I have an EpiPen on me, I can stab you with it. It doesn't, um, uh, the, uh, um, cardiac arrest, um, defibrillators, that's something else that uh, um, this has been used on um, successfully. And so to our knowledge, this was the first time that it was done with, um, with Narcan. So we started with formative research in, in Kensington. Um, we did interviews and, and focus groups um, with people who owned a smartphone and either fell into the category of having used uh, a misused heroin or some other opioid within the past 30 days, or um, they didn't, they were, um, uh, they, they knew someone who was uh, actively using in recovery or, um, was a deceased opioid user. So in this formative uh, study, we wanted to understand is there enough smartphone access and usage within the community that we have a critical mass to do um, uh, an a community-based intervention like this. Um, we wanted to learn from their experiences to uh, responding to overdoses and overdosing themselves. Um, what are the barriers to responding to an overdose and what would their attitudes be toward a smartphone application for responding to an overdose? Um, so I'm going to breeze past this and the spoiler is that they, uh, they were open to it. They were excited about it. They said it was like, um, an Uber for, for overdoses and they thought it was something that could, could help. And they were so, um, overwhelmed that they thought, great, another type of effort, some other approach to, um, to doing something about the huge uh, um, epidemic. So then we moved on to a pilot trial. We developed um, the app and we um, piloted it for one year. Uh, just before the pandemic hit, we were able to close out the pilot trial. Um, we had 112 participants who fell into about roughly half of them um, had non-medical opioid use in the past 30 days and the other half didn't. So they were former users or um, uh, um, family members, community members. They did a baseline survey. We trained, we downloaded the app, trained them on the app. And then we uh, timestamped and logged all of the app activities, uh, things they did within the app, like signaling an overdose, receiving an alert, agreeing or declining to respond to that uh, alert. And then following every incident that someone was involved in in some way, um, we sent a Qualtrics survey to them within um, 70, 72 hours. And our response rate for that was quite high, it was 84%. And then um, we recruited a, a subsample of 20 people out of those 112 for STEMI structured interviews at the end of the study to understand their experiences with the, being in the pilot. Um, so we had some descriptive statistics by the end of this. We did thematic analysis of the qualitative data and we triangulated across with the um, app logs and all of our data, the surveys and all the data sources. So to, to show you some of that data real quick on the time that I have left, um, this is a map of the northern part of Philadelphia. So downtown center city is just below um, the screen here. And you can tell um, that little piece, that little line there, uh, you can't quite say where it says Kensington, but the Kensington community is where they're all concentrated. But really there were overdoses signaled, you know, kind of across town as well um, in, the, in the northern part of the city. Um, so within the course of the year, there were 291 um, suspected overdose alerts signaled. 30% um, of those were false alarms. We do know there are some usability issues that we're working on that we think can account for those. Um, so we're doing that moving forward. And then of the remaining cases, 34%, um, 36% resulted in at least one dose of naloxone administered by someone from our study. Um, and then uh, of the remaining 63% of the time, 
um, our uh, uh, 911 was called, but no naloxone administration or follow up was reported by our survey respondents. And the one thing that's interesting is that the sometimes there were multiple doses of naloxone, as I mentioned, sometimes that's necessary. Um, the first dose was more often than not uh, administered by the person signaling the alert. So 70% of the time, somebody had naloxone and administered a dose of naloxone, but still signaled for help. So either because they wanted other kinds of support to, to um, so they weren't the only, in our formative research, this is something that some, that, that folks were saying that um, not being the only person there uh, uh, made them, would make them feel better because someone else's life was on the line. Um, or it may be that they thought another dose might be necessary. So um, one on-scene death was reported. So that was about 1% one, 1 of the time. Um, and then I will show you a few more quantitative things. Um, as we would expect uh, about in this neighborhood, about 30% of participants were homeless. Um, and then in the survey, we also asked them where the incidents um, occurred. So most of them were on the streets. Um, and then about 23% were in home and then other locations were in a business in a vehicle in someone else's home and in an abandoned building. So also quite a sort of range as we expected. And this is something we're interested in in terms of decision-making. Um, somebody might be putting their own safety at risk if they're going into something like an abandoned building. Um, uh, and so in making that decision about how far away it is, what kind of location it is, um, is something we want to be able to help responders and something that the app might be able to do more of. All right, and to tease some of our qualitative findings that I'm still digging through, um, I'm presenting a case study next month at the Communities and Technologies Conference and um, working on writing up more of these qualitative findings um, and have they have interesting design implications. So from our, um, uh, our the, the name of the app came from our formative work um, where uh, um, one of the biggest motivations for people to want this app was that they wanted to help each other. There wasn't a lot of trust of um, the police or professional first responders. There was a lot of concern of stigma and prejudice of um, people who are using drugs or are around drug use. And so the ability to get help from people like you um, uh, that you trust more than somebody, somebody who's an outsider um, uh, was huge. So that's why we named it Unity Philly. Um, and we and we went on to see within the pilot that this is the feeling that people were getting from, from participating. So someone said, it's essentially a community of people who have the app and we're meeting people, we're meeting strangers who have the same mission to get to that person who's overdosing. So occasionally I would come across other responders on the scene. So that was pretty interesting. And it was interesting to see that it wasn't EMS because it's a different vibe when EMS is on the scene. It's like it becomes a territorial thing with EMS. So we were, we were seeing that they were appreciating the shared mission with others. And even if it was strangers, they were they were pref they preferred to run into those strangers and feel like they're a part of that community rather than engaging with EMS. Um, and then someone else said, I liked that I was helping and involved with technology that might help people in my area with problems similar to my own, maybe different levels, but still, and I think that was great from a technology and a humane point of view. So that was, was definitely a common theme as well, that people had um, uh, some sort of tie to, to the issue that they were, um, they had a history of drug use or they had lost someone or knew someone and that made them very uh, motivated to help. Um, and then finally, uh, we had some indication that the, um, the radius that we use, the 15 minutes uh, uh, estimated response radius um, may be too much. So um, some people like this said, um, uh, were so motivated to respond and felt like they had to go no matter what. Um, uh, and they said, you know, when it was from here to Spring Garden, that's kind of far. I was a little stressed. And especially the one up on Fifth Street, that was rush hour traffic. And I'm like, oh shit, this person could be dead by the time I get there. It took me like 20 minutes. So this could indicate that we might want to, you know, play around with different, um, different distances. Uh, um, but, but to me, it's also more deeply thinking about the psychological costs of asking someone, you know, we had thought that going in, 
people would know it's a community-based intervention. There's other people who can respond. And yet there's still going to be a lot of people who feel very responsible and who are going to feel diff uh, um, like it's going to be hard to say they can't go and still feel responsible. Um, on the other hand, other people didn't mind and, and did say um, uh, there's a can't, you know, the ability to click the can't go button and say, well, it's not going to be me this time. I'm not able to respond to this one. Um, this person said, I like that it's there, that it could be moved to somebody else if I can't make it. So I don't feel as bad. It's a good feature to have. So if it goes to me and I can't be there, at least if I hit the can't go button, then somebody else will get the message. And then I don't really have any gripes about it. So there were different feelings about this, but I'm, I'm concerned about the people who are feeling the stress and feeling the need to go no matter what. And so this is something I want to um, pay closer attention to among many other, other things in the, in the interface that I think there's a lot to explore here. All right, so to wrap up um, with agency, um, this is a community-based intervention that um, complemented existing emergency response structures in a way that empowered the community to help them help one another instead of relying on what they felt were outsiders. Um, for this, this uh, population that's clearly marginalized, um, peer support is valued alongside tangible medical help, especially due to lack of trust in professional responders. So this is something that I want to explore more, that peer and social support that may be as important or even more important than, than the tangible response, uh, the tangible help. And then obviously in terms of trauma, I wanna consider more um, the potential um, increased exposure to overdoses um, uh, and that psychological cost of needing to respond and save someone's life. On the other hand, I think an intervention like this could also have other features that could help the community cope with the compounded trauma of the ep epidemic that they're experiencing. All right. Um, with that, uh, I'm ready for your questions. Um, many of these students have graduated. Some of them are coming your way to Irvine, um, but this is how I like to uh, think of them back in our lab with our post-it notes where we'll be very, very soon. So with lots of thanks to all of my students and collaborators, um, thank you so much. Thank you, Gabby. We have a good amount of time for questions. Uh, feel free to either write them in the chat or unmute yourself. However you want to go about it, it's fine. I, I'll kick off with one question while we're waiting for other people to formulate their thoughts. Um, so one thing that I thought was, was interesting in your first study is, um, one of the big takeaways was was that there was this space where technology could kind of impede mm -hmm. uh, your the the collaboration and communication that was happening. And I, I kind of I'm, I'm interested in reflecting a little bit on like as technologists, how should we think about those kinds of moments and how as researchers, how should we think about uh, reporting on them in the studies that we run or or seeking them out or or yeah, just how should we think about that in the kind of the broader context of, of the kinds of work that we do here in informatics? Yeah, that's a great question. I think some of it is what we're, what we're I think many of us are often thinking of is how do we make sure that the things that we're introducing into the world aren't just more screens and aren't more distractions and aren't more reasons for us to be you know, ignoring other human beings and staying indoors and not going outside and, you know, um, uh, and so I think in this context, it was, you know, sometimes we may be so focused on like, um, what information do we need and how do we get them, how do we get them to record this data and share this data. Um, and, and definitely in, in my work, you know, as we've, for example, tried to help parents be, sometimes parents don't feel like they're informed enough and they want more information about what's going on with their child in these other contexts so that they know what things that they that, that are going to work that they can also do at home but it's a you know how do we get them that information do we require the the practitioners to sit down and write more or put in um we do we try to automate nope that they didn't want that <laughs> they were very nervous about automatically sending information to parents especially in the special education context that can be very litigious 
Um, so uh, yeah, sometimes those tensions um, and those needs for information aren't just about sending them the data um, and giving them a portal where they can access things and feel like they have their hands on it. Sometimes it's about um, uh, giving them the space and helping them to build the relationships, which is not to say that technology, obviously technology can, but maybe, maybe we also think of those kinds of technologies too, instead of just thinking about, um, you know, what is the, the, the pure raw information, um, you know, like the other example too, sometimes it's not even about what the information is, but how it's communicated. So I think understanding the context of the relationship can also understand, can also help us understand um, how do we structure the information? How do we help them deliver the information in the right way? And how do we, um, uh, I, uh, my PhD student, Olivia uh, Richards um, did another, um, study uh, uh, right after this during the pandemic um, with parents of kids with special needs. Um, my, my cat has come to paw at me and say hello. So here's Charlie. Um, uh, and one of the things that came out of that study as parents were naturally overwhelmed and trying to be their child's teacher and their child's you know occupational therapist and physical therapist and their parents, <laughs> Um, was sometimes, you know, the parents wanted more information and wanted all these professionals to tell them how to have all, how to do all these things that they no longer had access to once the schools shut down. And one of the main takeaways was, you don't need to just take a deep breath. You don't actually need to be your child's teacher entirely, right? Your first job is still to be a parent. So sometimes the answer is not, let's give them the, all the information they want. Sometimes it's, Let's help them understand their role. Let's help them understand what, um, you know, how we can work together. And of course it was challenging during the, the pandemic when they didn't have those professionals there to, to give that kind of support um, directly to their child. Um, but yeah, those are, the, those are the kinds of things. That was, that was another really interesting example of, no, sometimes the parents need less information and more deep breaths and understanding they don't need to take on all of this additional role and and yeah thanks for that question thanks other questions oh my cat's gonna purr right next to the microphone <gasps> Get over. i'm sorry he's such a terror Uh, I'll throw out one more. Um, I so so for the second study, I was wondering, um, and this is this is kind of more of a, a a thought than a specific question, but I was I I was kind of wondering what whether you've um, looked at all at, at kind of the social psychology literature around like bystander effect or or kind of social responsibility, um, and what some of that work might suggest about how like the decision making that people are are making about um both wanting to get kind of uh back up from others but also you know in deciding whether or not they should take on the responsibility of uh providing care in a particular moment mm -hmm. that's a um here maybe i can stop sharing my screen now um yeah, that's a really good point. I think it's a pretty unique context in which to intervene in, in, a, in a couple different ways. So one is, I think it's fairly, it's fairly clear that someone is overdosing and dying and that you're the only one around who can help. And so there's not as much of that plausible deniability of like, oh, I'm sure they'll be fine or someone else will. I think it is, there's a little bit less of that problem because it's so op, you know, it's so obvious that someone needs your help right now. The sort of bigger problem in this case is um, the fear of the police and fear of the authorities. And, and so um, sometimes there's a hesitation to respond because they don't want to be seen around drug use or they're worried that if the cops come and they have a warrant out or, um, you know, there's that, that plays a 
bigger factor in decision making in this context. Um, not wanting to call 911. Um, yeah, and there's also uh, for people who have been around uh, someone who's overdosing and has has um, been revived. The even though it's a, it's a great thing that someone has been revived, um, uh, the downsides of that is it brings them out of their high so quickly that it's a very jarring and painful experience. So so you can have someone who's in distress who's in a lot of pain, who doesn't feel well, um, maybe uh, is even so um, uh, uh, experiencing depression or, or, or enough mental health challenges that they didn't want to live, um, that maybe they're disappointed that you brought them back to life or that you ruined their high, or it's a very complicated thing. So they can even become aggressive um, and so, uh, some people are aware of that and may also be hesitant to like, okay, maybe this is, if it's a larger person, um, and they get aggressive, you know, if I'm by myself, can I, can I handle that? Can I be okay with that? So, um, yeah, I, there, there's a, there's, it's a, it's a unique context in that way. And that's why I think the, um, having an app, um, to, to help facilitate some of that can be really powerful because we sort of were one, one step removed from the authorities. And you could even, you know, you don't have to call a nine call and, and talk to someone at 911. Um, we make the call for you. Um, you could even, if you really needed to, you know, send the signal and then leave, you know, we, we encourage you to stay with the person. It's best if you stay, but that could even be a scenario where it's better to, you know, signal it. And at least that signal has gone out and then leave the location than to not do anything at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's some interesting aspects where, where it can be kind of a social mediator or, mm -hmm. um, or kind of diffuse some tensions that often arise in these spaces as well. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks so much for the uh, wonderful presentation. I have a couple of questions related to your second thread of uh, research. Like I was, um, <laughs> if I were uh, to conduct the study, like these people are literally on the border of life and death. So I imagine that could be really uh, pressuring for uh, researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's really meaningful, but um, we are not therapists or medical professionals who have been trained to like how to deal with that uh, kind of pressure and stress. So what a what would be the right attitude of interacting with those people? Um, and my second question is, I imagine there might be some liability issues or uh, you might have some kind of, um, how do I say this, kind of responsibility to report to somewhere. I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't know too much about the opioid um, overdose, but yeah. As a researcher, you mean? Or, yes. Um, yes, great questions. Um, so, and I think part of the, the answer to both of them is that the reason that I um, uh, started this line of work is because I had the opportunity to, I was invited to collaborate by uh, public health researchers and sociologists who, uh, whose expertise is in this area. And so um, uh, I would not have been able to do this on my own with the training that I have, um, as great as my training has been um, uh, at Irvine and other places. It did not, <laughs> I was not trained um, for understanding the complexities of, of, uh, of opioid overdoses. Um, so, uh, so I was just there to purely be the, the HCI person and uh, my collaborators, um, I was able to rely on knew how to do all these things. So, um, but I'm really glad you bring up self-care because there are still plenty of times where we do this kind of research and um, it is difficult and it is heavy and, um, and, and we do need to take care of ourselves um, as researchers. And that is a skill 
um, and uh, type of support that 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 needs to be a part of of everything that we do. So um, I would hope that you know I think that students should should only be stepping into this work as students if they have the right kind of um, support and mentorship and space to um, you know to take the time that they need to and to to be able to manage whatever it is that that's coming up and whatever it is that um, they're encountering in their research. Um, so uh, yes, I did not, uh, let's see, the, they did, my collaborators did all the recruiting um, in the community and had the established relationships with our community partners. So I was mainly there to learn. Um, uh, for me, it was more field work and more ethnography where I was able to learn about this new space and learn from them. Um, it was important for me to try to pick up as much of the language as possible, um, to mirror, you know, I learned things like non-medical opioid user and our papers use the term N N NMOU for non-medical opioid user and, um, things like that. And to mirror, um, the respectful language and compassionate language that, um, that the experts use when they're in this area. So my job was to do the best I could at that, at learning and, and mirroring and using that language. Um, when I uh, ran focus groups, um, I always, um, I, guess I'll, I initially did it with, with one of them. And then once I understood enough, I think I might've done it by myself. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember, there might've always been one of them in the room though. And the one-on-one -on -one interviews were done by them. So, you know, I think one example of something that um, I wouldn't have wanted to do is be in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who started using language about drug use that I wasn't familiar with. And me even just, at, you know, my typical, um, at, at, at the way that I've been trained as a researcher and the way the things that I like to do as a qualitative researcher is just be curious and ask. And in most scenarios, people love to share things with you. But in this kind of context, asking can be read as judgment, right? You did what? What is that? Oh, why do you do that? Well, <laughs> so I would have not have wanted to be in a position where um, it could be read as me judging judging them or being anything but um, right, compassionate and, and supportive of what they're going through. Um, so I never sort of put myself in that position. Um, and then in terms of liability, uh, um, there are, I, and when you brought it up initially, I was thinking of um, the Good Samaritan law. So if the, when you're responding to an overdose, so not as a researcher, but someone who's responding to overdose is protected by a Good Samaritan law. So that if, you know, something wrong happens, you were, you know, you're protected that um, from liability from, you tried to help, you tried to do your best. Um, but for us, uh, yeah, this is, this uh, is, an NIH funded study at the um, National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, not the NIDA one specifically. Um, and so again, my collaborators knew exactly what to do. There's a certificate of confidentiality so that we can um, you know, protect the privacy and confidentiality of our participants. Um, we can't be subpoenaed for any of our data. And um, that one death that was reported during our study, we reported that to the NIH. Um, and then we worked with um, the local police and 911 so that we made sure um, that we were, you know, anytime an overdose was signaled, the professional responders were getting that notification. We sent them the, the coordinates, the GPS location so they could respond. So those are sort of the, the steps that we, um, we, we took. Yeah, thank you so much for your thoughtful answers. Thanks. Great questions. Uh, a comment from Anne Marie Piper in the chat. Thank you for the, the excellent talk. I love your comments on interviewing and thinking about our role as researchers. So, Thanks, uh, so thank you for that. Um, we can take one more question if there is one. I'll ask a question, Daniel. Go thank ahead. you. Um, Sorry, I'm here with kids in the background, so I've had my camera off, but wonderful, right. wonderful talk. Um, I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about how we should be caring for ourselves as researchers doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. I know that's a hard thing to answer, but just wondering if you had more thoughts you could share. Um, for me personally, it's uh, um, the support around me. So even when I wasn't doing, you know, very difficult 
emotionally difficult research. The most depressing period of time was when I had to work on my dissertation and I loved my dissertation and I loved my advisors, but it was way too isolating to be doing research on my own. It's what you have to do when you're doing a dissertation, but it did not make me happy. Um, and so that's the only time I've ever done that. And every other time it's having collaborators who are passionate about the work that we're doing. Um, and I never feel like I'm in it alone and I have mentors and I have mentees and, and I'm in it with other people. And so when there is a challenge like that, or there's something to reflect on or to debrief, um, it's easy to find those people. Um, and to also be in a department where people value the kind of work that I do and the time that it takes. And, um, I'm not the, you know, there's plenty of people in my department who do things that are really challenging. Um, who study misinformation online and who study abuse. And so, um, you know, I think if I were in a place that didn't value that as much, um, it would be really hard because I would feel like I was whining or like they just needed me to pump out papers and not be a, a feeling human being. <laughs> so I'm very grateful. I think being, being um, in the place that I'm at, I, I also feel very supported to to, to take risks and to do work that is challenging um, and to know that that's going to be valued. And if it takes us a little longer or um, we need to take some breaks or whatever it is we need to do or whoever we need to talk to, we know that that support's gonna be there. Otherwise I'd be scared about doing it. All right, that sounds like a, a great note to end the, the year on. So thank you, Gabby. Thank you all for, uh, for coming to today's talk and for coming throughout the series. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great summer, everyone.